I love Undie Sunday. I started this tradition at my church in Omaha a couple years ago, and uh, I don't think there's a better way to market the fact that we are doing fantastic ministry by providing children underwear in different situations. Now, choosing the underwear to wear to church over your jeans is always quite the obstacle. I don't think I have to say it again, but Undie Sunday is pretty awesome. We invite you to bring uh, children's underwear uh, next week and, and throughout the rest of the month as we support uh, children in need in our community, both through our We Care program and through um, open, or, uh, Helping Hand Mission, as an opportunity for us to be engaged in a larger conversation, not just about providing underwear for kids who need clean underwear and, and hygiene, but also as a way that we support our We Care program that is all about the prevention of child abuse and uh, a great opportunity for us to begin a larger conversation about issues that are happening within our community and the way our church is responding to meet those needs. Let us hear now the scripture from 1 Peter. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your heart sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness, gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that when you are maligned, those who abuse you for good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if suffering should be God's will than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through the water. And baptism, which is prefigured, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Thus ends the reading. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the richness and abundance of this life and for the joy of coming and worshiping you this morning. Lord, as we gather for worship today, we're reminded that worship isn't about us. It's about giving our hearts to you to participate with the work of the Holy Spirit during this time so that our hearts may be transformed, so that as we leave this place, we are equipped to change and transform the world. May the meditation of our hearts, minds, and souls be pleasing to you. Amen. I'm fighting an awesome sinus infection this week, um, which happens to me ever since. I think it's an Iowa thing, maybe. I'm joking. My ears are ringing, and earlier I was joking with Bob Lane. I said, maybe the ears ringing is just the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place this morning. I struggled this week with this scripture a lot because I think sometimes when I read this, I think about the pain and suffering in this world. So the first thing, the only word that stands out to me time and time again in this scripture is suffering. Suffering for doing good in the world. And I, I really struggled with that. I started to think about times in my life where I felt like I was doing good things and I suffered for it. This might surprise you, but when I was in high school, um, I was a bit of a martyr. I thought that every cause under the sun was a cause worth fighting for. 
And it started from a very young age. The first time I led a boycott was in fifth grade. Our music teacher had decided to start docking everyone points in class when anybody spoke out of turn. So we organized ourselves, and none of us sang or spoke the entire half an hour we were in there. It didn't take long for the superintendent to sit in music class with us, at which point we tried to negotiate terms. We lost. The next time we decided to, to try something out was with the lunch program. We wanted better ketchup in our kitchen. They refused to increase the quality of the ketchup, so we all brought our own. We lost that one too. Then I got to high school, and I was student council president one year, and I had discovered an injustice in the world that just could not continue. When I was young and elementary in my K 12 school, they would set timers on the lunch table for the first 15 minutes of lunch. And during that first 15 minutes of lunch, no child sitting there was supposed to speak. It was to encourage the younger children to eat their lunch. And then after the timers went off, you could talk. I thought this was ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And I didn't even like recess, so as an elementary student, I oftentimes spoke anyway and then just stayed in during recess. But by the time I got to high school, I was equipped and ready to do something about it. So we decided to buy this really cool stoplight decibel reader. Have you ever seen one of these things? It actually measures the decibels in the room. Which allows you to kind of see, and you can set the standard, and if you get a little loud, it goes to yellow, and then if it went to red, you knew you were being too loud. We thought this was a great compromise and a way to kind of encourage the, the kids to self monitor themselves. It seemed like an educational opportunity for everybody. It was working brilliantly. However, the issue with decibels, time and time again, are that there are certain things that you do in a lunchroom that are just louder than if you're just having a conversation. Like when you set your tray down hard on the table or your fork falls on the ground, it's a higher decibel. And so it would hit red and they would take five minutes off of all of the students' recess. Injustice. I observed the behavior for several days and then decided to go and talk with the office secretary who watches the lunchroom and provides、uh, a quite a controlled environment in there. And she said, Well, how can we tell the difference? I said, Can't you already tell the difference that they're quieter in here now than they ever have been? She didn't like the direction I was going and continued to pursue their mode of operation. Finally, one day I had had enough. I marched into the superintendent's office and I said, Listen, that was my first problem. <laughs> I said, Mr. Dak, we bought it, and if you're not going to use it the way you're supposed to, we'll take it away. Mr. Dak was a very kind gentleman. He was missing one thumb from his rodeo days, which meant every time I saw him in the hallway, I would say, Give me four instead of five. <laughs> Mr. Dak sat in his desk. He postured a little and said, Sam Fisher, do you think it's appropriate for you to talk to me that way? I said, Do you think it's appropriate for you to use a gift that we gave you in an inappropriate way? I lost. <laughs> But I didn't lose the whole battle. I literally walked into the cafeteria and removed it from the wall and stored it in the student council storage area. Unfortunately, I didn't really foster. And build relationships with the administration. So you can imagine anything I wanted to do the rest of the year was an up.
uphill battle. To the point when, when I graduated high school, I was at a conference with the superintendent's wife, and she looked at me and said, "He's never been more excited to see somebody graduate." <laughs> It was my Spanish teacher, though. Who, after all of this had gone down, and I got on this little trip about making sure that there were no injustices in the school, who looked at me one day and said, "I think you're being a zealot. You're being a zealot." Now I didn't even know what the word zealot meant, right? I went home, I looked it up, and as a dear friend of mine, I was kind of concerned and frustrated with the fact. That she would have the nerve to call me a zealot for trying to make the cafeteria a better place, and yet that word stuck with me. You see, I think when the author of First Peter, maybe the disciple Peter, we're not a hundred percent for sure. Was writing this, he wasn't writing to us about general suffering that happens in life. When we lose someone we love, or or when things don't go our way, or when we're ill for a long period of time, or somebody has a terminal disease, the suffering that Peter is talking about here is really the idea that in early Christianity, widespread persecution existed for what they believed, and to stand out against the crowd, to live a life much different than other people. To be who we are truly called to be in Christ was going to put a target on their back. See, I get scared when I read this lesson and I think about suffering because I think oftentimes the church will do horrible things to people and tell you that it's okay to suffer in the situation you're in because that's the way that you build character, right? I recently went to a, a film. We took the open to church up, and we bought the theater for the night, and and we went in, and we had a great time. And I was sitting there, and、uh, it was the Case for Christ. I'm sitting there in the movie, and I'm I'm laughing hysterically at the end. There's a scene where all of a sudden the wife, who has been trying to convert her husband to Christianity for most of the movie as she's been on this journey, she sits there and she takes his abuse day in and day out. The man becomes a raging alcoholic, yells at her, emotionally abuses her, and the response is to pray as much as she can, and eventually he'll be converted to Christ. And at the end of the movie, it happens just like that. I am sitting there laughing, and I turn my head, and the person I'm sitting next to is crying because it's just such a beautiful story. As if we, not thinking about it, are encouraging people to stay in extremely unhealthy relationships, suffering for the faith, to bring other people into the fold. It's not the kind of Christianity. I think that we're exposed to be experiencing. Even more so, I think about our identity as Christians. Today, living in a country where maybe we're not persecuted for our faith, or or maybe we are. No offense to you, my friends, but here in the Midwest, we're kind of in this comfortable, isolated bubble that tells us being Christian is normal. But it doesn't take long to travel the world or to get into the cities. Where we quickly find out that the word Christian no longer is a positive term. There's a lot of baggage with the term Christian. We are bigoted. We're hypocrites. We don't really practice what we preach. We don't extend love to people the way we're supposed to. Churches are giant monuments to God, and we would rather worship the. Uh, letters in a book, then understand the way that possibly God is moving us beyond the letters of that book. And I think about how important it is for us as Christians today to reclaim who we are, whose we are, and what we will and will not stand for. 
One of the things that is deep-rooted in our tradition, in the Methodist tradition, is an understanding of social holiness. Now, for many years in the United Methodist Church, we've kind of decided that social holiness is a synonym for social justice, right? We, have, we put a huge emphasis on what it means to be active in seeking justice in the world. We've replaced this understanding of social holiness with our actions for social justice. Evan Roars Dodge writes an interesting article where he says maybe the United Methodist Church has truly lost its identity because we've replaced social holiness with social justice. Social justice being this understanding that we are supposed to fight for or to create a place where everyone has equal access, whether it be economical, uh, civil liberties, um, political, social, We all deserve the same rights and privileges. And we as a church are dedicated to making sure that everyone has that type of access. Maybe the reasons that the United Methodists are so vocal about things when healthcare is a conversation in our country. But the understanding of social holiness is much different from that. John Wesley says, the beauty of holiness of that inward man of the heart which is renewed after the image of God. This inward religion bears the shape of God so visibly impressed upon it. See, John Wesley said that you can't have holiness without social holiness. Our personal holiness and the building of ourselves and creating, moving towards perfection, restoring the image of God in our own lives only happens as we interact, engage, and converse with our brothers and sisters in Christ. That is to say that the Gospel of John and and the Gospels in its entirety remind us yet again and again and again that the greatest commandment is to love God with all of our mind, soul, spirit, whatever, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. To reach perfection, to reach sanctification, To reach social and personal holiness, we must grow in our understanding of what God is doing in the world and truly love our neighbor as ourself. The problem with social justice, then, is that social justice focuses on what we as individuals, or maybe collectively as people do, but what we can physically do to change the world around us. Social holiness reminds us that it is first about how God is moving and guiding us. It reminds us that it is what God does first through prevenient, justifying, and sanctifying grace that collectively holds us together. Again, that maybe the only reason we can love, the only reason that we can seek equality in our world is because God first loved us. And through the actions of Jesus Christ and through the sacrificial love of Christ and his suffering for us on the cross, we can live into a world of social justice. You see, when Peter was talking about being a martyr or suffering for good in the scripture today. What he was talking about is that oftentimes in in the early Christianity, it was a positive thing to be a martyr. Martyrs moved right to the front of the line and entering into the heavenly gates. There were accolades that come with being a martyr for the faith during a time of persecution. This is really not a a scripture that says, don't suffer, uh, or or suffer, or don't suffer. It's a scripture that says, what is your motivation for doing what you're doing? How do we truly know we're living into what we're supposed to be living into, aka God's will, as opposed to seeking our own self-ego needs? I'm reminded of a story of John Wesley at the end of his own life. John Wesley uh, was kind of retired. He's 86, nearing the end of his life, and it was 1789. He had written one of his very last sermons, a sermon that he would never preach 
but a sermon that we have written. He was returning to Dublin to meet with a society meeting where he was feeling quite frustrated with the United Methodist movement. John Wesley, by all means, should have been a very feeling, very successful. He was a very accomplished man. United Methodism or Methodism in the United States was one of the largest religious groups. The way that they had moved in their community and and fought for education and and tried to eliminate poverty and and the growth in the movement of the Methodist movement was was widespread and fantastic. He was a well-published author at this point in time. But unfortunately, John Wesley was struggling. John Wesley decided to pick a a scripture from Jeremiah about where is the balm in Gilead? Why do people still suffer? John Wesley, at the end of his career, was not satisfied with what the Methodist movement had done. And in all reality, was asking the question, if the Methodist movement had had become so successful... Why hasn't the world become a better place? Why hasn't the world become a better place? Do you think about that in your own personal faith or in the faith of our community? Why is it that we gather week in and week in again and again, that we continue to build this understanding of our own maturity and discipleship and that we're engaged in our community and our world and yet it doesn't seem like our world's becoming a better place? Dean Schneider, Reverend Dr. Dean Schneider, says maybe perhaps... Our calling is not to be a church. It is to heal the world, to be a balm in Gilead, to be physicians for the poor, the enslaved, the imprisoned, the addicted, the oppressed, the victims of violence, and those denied education. Reminding us that as we build ourselves as we converse and engage in our community, as we build in our own discipleship, we can't do it alone. Seeking a community of people who will grow with us, both spiritually and engaging in the world around us, is the only way we will continue to make the world a better place. It is not being a zealot and standing at a pulpit wearing underwear, trying to encourage you that by bringing underwear, you're going to make the world a better place. I could be a martyr all day long. And yet, it does nothing to do what we're supposed to do in the world. I'm going to read some statements that may be a little difficult for you to hear. I think when I look at Peter and he reminds us to respond in humbleness and reverence and gentleness, the words from John Pavlovitz ring true with me. John Pavlovitz says, I refuse to be a Christian, a Christian without Jesus. And oftentimes I feel like my church follows the laws of man as opposed to the laws that Jesus taught us. He creates a list here. I refuse to be a Christian who lives in fear of people who look or speak or worship differently than I do. I refuse to be a Christian who believes that God blesses America more than God so loves the world. I refuse to be a Christian who uses the Bible to perpetuate individual or systemic bigotry, racism, or sexism. I refuse to be a Christian who treasures allegiance to a flag or a country or a political party above emulating Jesus. I refuse to be a Christian who is reluctant to call out the words of hateful preachers, venomous politicians, and mean-spirited pew-sitters in the name of keeping Christian unity. I refuse to be a Christian who tolerates a global church where all people are not openly welcomed, fully celebrated, 
and equally cared for. I refuse to be a Christian who speaks always with holy war rhetoric about an encroaching enemy horde that must be rallied against and defeated. I refuse to be a Christian who is generous with damnation and stingy with grace. I refuse to be a Christian who can't see the image of God and people of every color, every religious tradition, and every sexual orientation. I refuse to be a Christian who demands that others believe what I believe, or live as I live, or profess what I profess. I refuse to be a Christian who sees the world in a hopeless spiral downward and only condemn it or withdraw from it. I refuse to be a Christian devoid of the character of Jesus, his humility, his compassion, his smallness, his gentleness with people's wounds, his attention to the poor and the forgotten and the marginalized, his intolerance for religious hypocrisy, his clear expression of the love of God. And I refuse to be a Christian unless it means I live as a person of hospitality, of healing, of redemption, of justice, of expectation, defying grace, of counterintuitive love. These are the non-negotiables. Peter reminds us that to be a Christian is counterintuitive. That in a world that tells us we must do one thing or act one way, Christ is leading us into a world that is much different than what we're protecting. Maybe the reading of those statements will make you think about something that you've always held on to. And maybe for us as a community, the first step is just taking one of those central ideas and allowing to humble ourselves enough to think about the way Christ is leading us into this world. And maybe your own personal suffering is swallowing your own pride and understanding to seek the guidance of Jesus in your life. The way Christ is calling us to something bigger and greater. The way that provenient and justifying and sanctifying grace has enveloped you and created you to be a mature Christian. And our willingness to allow God to move us somewhere different. We may suffer for what we believe. We may suffer to be a Christian. We may suffer in our own spiritual lives. We may suffer to be in community with people who are different from us. But it is with hope, joyful hope, that can't be explained by people who are not of our faith because they don't have the experience of resurrection, that we can respond to one another to seek to grow in our relationship with God and to love our neighbor as ourself. Thanks be to God. Amen.